collaborative learning is, is one of our QEP goals. Um, when we chose what we were going to do for our QEP, we wanted to focus on four students' skills. <clears throat> Critical thinking, learning to cooperate with others, uh, speaking across the curriculum, and writing across the curriculum. I say sometimes that I wish we had also included reading because my personal feeling is that's one of the biggest deficits. Go on, in jail. Get there. Uh, and you know, and I, I try to work with my students on that. Uh, Jeff knows some of the idiosyncrasies of our history department, and, and of course, y'all probably do too. And we're actually similar sorts of things, uh, but we focus a great deal on skills, and, and not very much on handing history out as a, a product, of, as a process by which to cut a sense of world around you. And some of that probably reflected. A lot of times when I have a large group, I'll say, you know, turn to the person next to you, say, hello, I'm glad you're here. Uh, ask your colleague about a positive classroom experience they had this semester. We're kind of small, I don't think we necessarily have to do that. But there'll be some things that I'll talk about today that will probably seem a little strange. Uh, and uh, I won't say that I do. Uh, <laughs> it seemed kind of appropriate for Texas to uh, but our agenda today is simply to welcome you here, talk a little bit about the goals, to establish a positive climate, to give you a little research about cooperative learning, and then do a wrap up, and especially to give you a chance to ask any sort of questions that you might have. My experience in working with faculty about collaborative learning is uh, some standard questions come up. That there'll be some reservations that you'll have, and I think you ought to voice those because you're not alone in thinking those sorts of things. You know, how well does it work? problems I'm going to encounter, you know, what about this issue, you know, uh, I'll do my best to answer. Uh, you know. The group that we've used before and, and had uh, folks down from the University of Minnesota recently again with the Johnsons, uh, they're well known in cooperative learning. Um, I shared with Sabrina a uh, book that Excellent for anyone to consider, and I would even suggest that y'all's college ought to buy all these things. Mm -hmm. uh, this one I think is a bit better suited than the Johnsons' work to working in college settings uh, because uh, Barclay is excellent. K. Pat Cross is, of course, one of the best known people in community college education. Uh, and while I don't know Claire Howell Major, I know that the book that the three of collaborate on is excellent. The first part of that is largely the theory. Get in the second half, you get a lot of specific examples of things that you can do and ways that you can use collaborative learning in your classroom. And not just in face to face, but even in online settings. I confess I've not done that yet. In fact, what I'll be doing today is both trying to heighten an awareness here, you know, and get, get some basic ideas out about uh, collaborative learning. Um, and then, you know, have you entertain some notions, ask some questions. But as I do so, uh, I'll be telling you things that the theory says to do that, that frankly I don't do. Uh, I think among the best things that you can do if you start to use any sort of new uh, approach is to do what you feel comfortable with. Because I think when you get terrific out of your comfort zone, you're probably not going to be terrifically successful. I know I'm not, actually. Things that seem to resonate with my approach to teaching. So keeping that in mind. This is a uh, model. Your models of student interaction. Uh, you see the little mushrooms <coughs> cooperation overarching both the, the individual and the competitive modes. Uh, the Johnsons are committed to the notion, and I think they're accurate, that all of these are appropriate modes. That there are times when you want to have students working individually in some sort of criteria. There may be times when you want to have a competition, uh, but they feel that overarching that should be an essentially cooperative atmosphere in the classroom. One that uh, at the bottom that feels positive interdependence. We'll talk a little bit about that. When I take <coughs> turn it over, I want you to silently count the number of squares that you see. The first to find the most squares gets the A in the class and can even have a mint. Mm -hmm. uh, the second, uh, a B, the third, a C. Evaluation is norm referenced. So, 
within the norms of the group. Whoever is first, that's the one that gets the prize. Second, that sort of thing. So it is utterly complete. Expectations were by itself, you know, how in that distraction. <coughs> We can stop here. We, we okay. may take too long for this. <laughs> <laughs> Carmen got 40, and it is 40, and I have a heck of a time explaining that. I mean, sometimes people forget the the overall square. You know, I, I was looking at this the other day, and I, I kept coming up. I had I counted that already? Had I done that already? It's just driving me crazy. I, thought, I know they're 40, but I can't I don't know if I can show you where they are. The thing about this, and the reason for doing this, is something. I want you to to think a minute about how you felt that you're doing that. It's either work from the inside out or the outside in. Okay, you're 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 talking about your feelings are more about method, how to approach it, right? Well, I felt yeah. very aware of um, a lack of motivation except what I wanted to give <laughs> to, <laughs> to it myself. You know I mean? um, there, was, there was no one else motivating except for yeah. me, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I didn't want to be the first one to raise my hand and put a guess out there. I don't know why. Well, well that's, that's a common thing. <laughs> <students, laughs> you know, yeah. I'm teaching a world sim and I'm having them do reading logs and, and I, I have them turn them in before class and they're up on canvas and I can look at them and I can see they're reading this stuff. They know what's in there. And I'll get in class and I'll say, okay, what about the, you know, I, I'm not going to talk. You know? That's kind of a common feeling in our seats. Well, I felt like I should have done something else. What else did you feel? Carl, what did you feel? Well, you got it right. Well, I know, but the first time you did. Yes. <laughs> As you're doing that, how would you describe the feelings? I got second guess with myself. Yeah. Okay. I always feel a lot of nervousness because I don't want to be in the group at the bottom. I think nervousness is one of those. I would, I would think most people would experience as they do that sort of thing. You know, uh, I'm old enough that when you know I was in college, you'd go in and you'd have instructors say things like, "It's gonna be three A's in the class," and so you know, you look around and who all have I got to meet to get that A? You know, that sort of thing. Um, uh, maybe there's value in it. I don't know, uh, but I'm not sure it's conducive to really deep. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Um, Dana, the, the part that was fun was the fact that, the, the positive, is that it was fun. It was just like a game. Mm -hmm. um, although, like Jeff said, I didn't want to be the person to raise my hand. Right. And I didn't want to not succeed. Right. But there was kind of a fun aspect to it that motivated well, good. Well, that's, again, because you're in a real familiar situation, you know, and, you know, there's nothing but attached to this. You don't have a grade waiting on this or anything like that. You know, Lord, when I was in college, you failed. You get to go to the Army. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was not good. <laughs> the uh, competition characteristics, you know, one person can obtain her goal if and only if the others fail to obtain theirs. You know? So if somebody got there before Carmen, she loses. Or it gets beat. Negative, there's a negative correlation among goal attainments when somebody gets their, gets their goal, the others don't. So it's just, uh, the Johnsons call this, if I swim, you sink, if you swim, I sink. Individual goals, norm reference evaluation, winners of the goal. Uh, there's also the individual mode, and we're not going to worry too much about that, but there are times when you just have students uh, compete against a criterion. And if they, you know, if they meet the criterion, that's great. You know. And there's certainly a lot of times you know, each person who finds 90% of the squares gets an 80% of the B, that sort of thing. Uh, expectations, of course, work by yourself. Uh, characteristic of this, uh, your goal attainment is unrelated to anybody else's. Uh, no correlation there. You're each in the moment. And lastly, the cooperative mode, which, of course, is what we're concerned with. You know, I'm going to give you a similar sort of task, and let's see. You, you two might work together. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then the three of y'all that can work together. Um, okay. I want you to do a, a similar okay. sort of thing. In just a second, we'll turn those over and I want you to do a similar sort of thing. 
uh, well, one answer from the group. It is criteria reference. We all remember standard guidelines that we used to know what you're seeing there. Uh, individual accountability, I haven't really talked about the elements of collaborative learning yet, but one of the things that the faculty are always intensely concerned with is if I have students working in groups, how do I try to assure that there's individual accountability in one of them? Uh, one of the ways, especially if you're working in class, is that uh, you may be, I mean, I may have a table like I'll, uh, and as an example, in my world student <coughs> class, they do some pretty heavy readings. They may read like from Conyers Manifesto or something by David Hume or something like that. And so I divide those up and I have maybe part of the class reading one set of readings, another set over here, another set over here. So they're responsible for sort of teaching the rest of the class about what in an effort to try to ensure that they're all on the same page, I said, okay, you be one to your table to explain you know, what y'all have talked about here as you confer about what's important in that particular document. That's what it And that way, you know, you do that once or twice, and if, if the table's evaluation is riding on that, each, each member's going to make sure that all are up to speed sufficient that they can recount what's, what's important right there. So that's one way to go about this. So, Turn them over and see if you can identify the number of triangles in there. Okay, they're 18. And I'll be able to be 17. Yeah. Um, 16 to 18 triangles, you get an 8, 14 to 15, 8. I think we have a bunch of excellent. I think we've got a good one. Same question. How is it different from when you were doing it individually and different from school? It was still competitive. Because you felt in competition with others. Yeah. But we had a shared responsibility. So yeah. there's a lot more willing to just start. Yeah. 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 You know, some of that may be my fault and not stressing enough that you're not really so much in competition. You're trying to figure out how many there are. When you get it, you're there, you know. It is criteria, right? Yeah, you're just meeting the criteria. Right. It's not like group one, right. if you only want to get an A, and right. group two gets right. a B, and the rest of right. us get a C. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's not going to charm us. But I think that uh, the reason why I was saying that is because after doing this activity, and, and if you want to sort of parallel that with our students that come in, this is what they're used to. They're used to competition all the time. All right. The moment you put them into groups, mm -hmm. getting that competition down, it, it takes it takes time. Because we were in this mode, yeah. I think. Yeah. You know, as I said, we started this too. There, I think there are times when it probably is appropriate to have competition. Um, my personal feeling is that probably within groups is not bad. Uh, I don't feel terrifically good doing it just among individual students again because of the variability of the experiences and the, you know, the likelihood that some of them feel like they're, you know, in, the inability to do this is just once again ratified, you know, that sort of thing, and I, I hate that. Um, anyway, the one of the things that's part of uh, the theory of collaborative learning is that uh, you should build in feedback. And so we don't have to do this because I don't want to take a whole lot of time on this, but among the things that I do, in fact, the only thing that I do that's always uh, group work that has a group grade in my classes is doing critical thinking analyses in class. Jeff knows what I'm talking about. We use a rubric from the Critical Thinking Foundation, the Eight Elements of Thought, and I'll have them read an article outside class and do an analysis of it on those eight points, <clears throat> bring that in, and then the last 30 minutes of class at their tables, I'll have them pull out their individual ones, collaborate on that, and draw up a, a unified, or a consensus one, and that's what I grade. Um, among the reasons that I do this, uh, there, there are several, I think, that, that I think are served. One, I, I don't, I've never had much success having students do group work outside. Their, their schedules are too variable, uh, too hard for them to get together. You'll hear reports about how, well, you know, John just didn't do his part, you know, and I had to carry it. And, you know, how do you deal with those things? I've never dealt well with a person, so I don't. But when I'm in class, I can see what they're doing. 
Plus, I've had them upload those things into Canvas. I mean, I'm, they're there before the class starts. You know, if they're not there, they get to be early. <laughs> but they make it to the CTA. Um, it cuts my grading by a factor of four, because I have four people at each table, so I only get one paper from six tables since we have 24 people in the class. Um, and it gets them collaborating. Um, so it's one of the things I think that is particularly helpful, but when what I do with those is I take them, I grade them, I bring them back to the next class, hand them out, I put my own analysis up on the other Yeah, and tell them this is not the way to see it, but it's the way I saw it. I think it's helpful for you to be able to compare what you did with what, how I saw it and get questions to ask. The thing about this is at the conclusion of it, if I'm on my toes with this, I'll say, now I want you to take about a couple of minutes and at your table we'll talk about how you did it, both in terms of, you know, what you did. How could you have done this better? And how could you have worked more effectively with them? It is sort of feedback loop each time so that ideally they're starting to learn from the process they're going through and do better as the semester goes on. And generally they do. I mean, you know, my experience is that their first and second CTAs are not all that great, but then as we go on, and in the world civ, I do 13 of these things, uh, they get really good for them. I think it's a, a ter terrifically important task to be able to do to scan stuff quickly and be able to get just a gist of what the major points are, pick up the conclusion, ask what assumptions are being made by the, the author of that, and those sorts of things. So, your reaction to the different learning experiences. Carl had said he felt differently between you know, individually looking at the squares and then having someone work uh, with him on the triangle. Is that a common thing? about it. In fact, my first couple of classes I see is really critical because I don't get into the material, I get into what's going to happen in that class the whole semester, you know, what they can expect, what it's going to look like, what they probably will, you know, be a little concerned about, you know, and uh, that it's understandable. It's sort of a new experience for them and I feel the same way in their shoes, that sort of thing. Um, I do tell them that years ago when I was administrator up in Omaha, they were doing training with the staff, and there was an instrument that we used uh, that had, I, I don't remember the name of it or who put it out, but there were like 30 tasks that were sort of related, and you, you to do those things individually, put them in what looked to be the appropriate order to you, right, you know, by yourself, and then take that and get into a group and negotiate what the rankings of those things were, what was the best first thing to do and score both, no individualized work. And, you know, a light went off in my head. I thought, well, you know, that kind of makes sense. We're all smarter than any one of us is smart. Uh, and I, when we get into questions of diversity, that's one of the things I say to you. One of the real values of diversity is you get some very different takes on things, some very different understandings of things. You know? And you're going to produce a better product. I think you are. <laughs> uh, what are some areas of concern that y'all have regarding cooperative learning? Uh, 
not getting enough content. Um, That's the first and most common thing. I teach philosophy, and when my students come in, I mean, they may have had history or art or math or um, some of these other subjects uh, in secondary school, but uh, when they come to my class, it's their first. Yeah. Yeah. So. Absolutely. What else? Well, it can spill over into the social science sometimes. Yes. And yes. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. that can absolutely. be absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah. and that can be they can be socially distracted, or yeah. they can actually be it can be a problem yeah. where they actually yeah. start having a, yeah. not aggression towards each other, but they have a lot well, of yeah. hurt feelings. Uh, yeah, I start out this, this semester concerned that they get to know one another well, uh, and then sometimes I worry they know each other way too well. <laughs> and and you, you can you monitor those things, you know, and kind of do some things to help it. Um, We've already talked about basically this. You know that if you're in that cooperative mode, that it is we sink or swim together. Um, we brought down when we were starting this uh, after we had the Johnsons. Now we brought in some folks from Richmond, but I used to teach at the Richmond College of Dallas with Jackie Conch, and uh, they have a couple of faculty up there that do their training. One of whom's a chemistry instructor. You know, and I'm thinking that's got to be tough. She has her groups to the point where, you know, if one student there is having a problem, she'll turn to that group and say, you know, is everything okay? And they'll say, we've got to take care of, you know, and they will they'll basically tutor that student and make sure that they get him or her up to speed and sort of thing. I confess I'm not there. <laughs> I'm not that good a user of it. But, you know, I think it can be done and done well. Uh, she buys them the tub and, and uh, I think that's a fabulous job. Um, the question about assigning students to groups, I said I do it randomly. Teacher assigned, we talked a little bit about, I, we had an English faculty member many years ago out at Northwest Vista that because she was teaching writing, her theory was that she'd like to have in groups of four, a strong writer, a weak writer, and a couple in between. So she tended to try to get writing samples from them initially, uh, maybe one or two before she started putting them into groups and do them in something uh, subject matter rate self selected, and there are others that it sounds like you don't have some interesting ways to approach this. But the important thing I think is that all the research tells us that how important contact is before work. And what I mean by that is, again, getting them into sort of a safe place where they feel comfortable with whom they're working, where again they're lowering that affective filter. You know, they feel like they, they, the more they know about the person at the table with them, so feel the more they feel invested in that person, in, in the group itself, and in, in its success. Um, the, among the things she does, and I have to tell you, I don't do this, I feel so hopeful if I did this, but she'll have them do, you know, turn to one another at the beginning of class and tell them to say, I'm glad you're here, thank you for helping, I enjoy working with you. It seems contrived to me, and I don't feel comfortable doing it, but you know, it works for her, and it might for you too, I don't know. Uh, Tips for trust building, simple things like, you know, have to talk about a favorite class, have to share some about their family, recommend a book or movie. Um, I have it, a lot of times in the past used icebreakers, and I'm willing to share with you the ones that I have drawn up. Um, these are things that I might have um, students talk about. I'll come into the class, and while I'm distributing papers, Role and any of the sort of housekeeping things, I may tell them to. Uh, I might tell them to, you know, share what their favorite movie is, you know, and just to make sure that they do it just before we get started in the material. I may take, you know, I may say table three, which also, you know, or in fact to make sure they're paying attention, I may say to John at table three, what did your table say, John? You know, so he has to recount what all he said. I don't necessarily recommend favorite movies. You should be depressed. You know, it won't be Citizen Kane, trust me. There'll be things you think, why did you spend your money going to see that? You know, used to when it was Jackass, the movie I thought. Uh, uh, I can't wear it. You know. But the important thing about it is that it is safe, that they're not too revelatory. You know, not getting into anything too personal. It's something anybody can talk about. You know, language theorist said many years ago, what students can do together today 
And with Fiji, I, when I was in graduate school in education, I kept running up against a few folks, and Makichi was one of them. And his answer was most effective in teaching. So the best answer is that it depends on the goal of student content teacher. Next best answer is students teaching other students. Wealth of evidence, peer teaching is extremely effective for a wide range of goals, content, students of different levels of personality. Uh, can the using groups solve all problems? The dog ate my homework. <laughs> uh, but this is something that uh, in teaching collaboration, a couple of our psychology faculty said, where'd you get it? And I said, well, I'm not exactly sure it's kind of been passed down. You know, and he said, no, I'm not too sure that's correct. And I said, well, I don't know either, but it sure seems to have face validity to me. You know, the notion <laughs> that uh, when we, how much you retain from things, the different modes of learning, from lecturing, from reading, from having audio presentations, from demonstration yourself, from discussion groups, from practicing by doing, and lastly, teaching others or being a use of uh, And that pretty much corresponds to my experience. You know, when you think about it, it's no different really from what Dewey said in the 1910s and 20s. Uh, <coughs> just that we seem to have gotten very quickly when we started mass education into an almost industrial mode of education. Uh, in the 1830s, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, students are not vessels to be filled, they're lamps to be lit. And to me, it's an incredibly important insight. It's one we often lose sight of. And it's sort of my talks about the content. Um, in fact, we're going to look at some research in just a minute. I want to talk to you about that content question. Um, Makichi, again, uh, in one of his studies, found that students retain about 70% of the first 10 minutes of the lecture, but only 20% of the last 10 minutes. I don't know how long that lecture is. I mean, you're probably being told these days that if you do a lecture, you probably need to keep it to about seven minutes and then stop and do something that's more active. Uh, I've seen films from uh, Harvard where there's an astrophysicist that is uh, teaching a fairly large group, and he will he follows that principle. He'll he'll talk about something for a few minutes and then he'll say, "Turn to your partner and you know share what we just said. Act, you know, see if you got any questions, those sorts of things." Anything to break it up so that you're not just constantly putting out information in front of them. Um, so the rules of the when students were asked to discuss with the part of the teacher presented at frequent intervals during class, they received up to two letter grades higher than students in the control group. I think that's part of that. You didn't immediately. Um, one of the things when we brought in folks from the Critical Thinking Foundation. Uh, we had Jerry Nossich coming in from University of New Orleans. And he talked to us about the CI method. When you're trying to get uh, something across to somebody, see if they can do the CI method. Can they state it? Can they give an example of it? Uh, can they illustrate it? And let's give up the example. And, uh, see, I can't remember my theory now. Um, Explanation. Uh, and if they can do all those things about a concept, you figure they've got it. Plus, they've had to think about it in different sorts of ways, you know, and that may, may help better with them, too. The thing, this, this single thing has had, has caused me more thought about my teaching than anything else I've encountered in a long time. A study, I think, at the University of Alabama, back in biology, you can see 25 group of students who had taken an introductory psychology course, I think about a year out from having taken or tested on the basic principles of psychology. As a control group, students who had never taken it before took the same test. Those who took the psychology course scored 80% better than people who had never taken the course before. Dean, what does it make you think? Well, the first question in my mind what do they have to get out of my class? Yeah. Because they're sure not going to remember all the stuff they crammed in. 
you know, I started teaching in college in 1973 before Claudine was born. <laughs> and I did just as I had been done unto. Uh, I lectured, I tested, you know. I made myself feel better by you know, giving, using those little Scantron sheets that you could do an essay too, so you had some multiple guesses and then you could do an essay on there. You know. um, I started moving away from that more and more when we started focusing on skills and students, uh, writing and that sort of thing. I thought, well, I really should be doing more writing. You know? uh, and then just left testing behind entirely when I got down here. Uh, I walk into my classes today and I say, I don't lecture and I don't test. And they like, yeah. And they say, but what do we do? And I say, well, what are you going to read? You're going to write a lot. You know? <laughs> Uh, and there are ways in which, you know, I have found that you can lighten your grading load. I do feel as if I grade a whole lot, <laughs> as if I value a lot, and, and that's true. But honestly, if you think about it, we're moving from being the source of knowledge to being more a manager of their learning, trying to get them into the mode of learning and teaching themselves. Um, when I started North Coast Vista, as I said, I was in a quasi-administrative role, and I, I hired a lot of faculty. And I think everybody I hired at some point or another, I said, you know, that first of all, teaching is an act of faith. You have to believe that you're sowing seed. You're probably not going to see the result of somebody else will. You know. You're in fact seeing them from what somebody for you did. Um, and that I think the most important thing you can do is to equip them to teach themselves. You're in a business of making yourself unnecessary. You know? And that sounds odd, but I think if collectively we in college do our job well, students leave us better able to teach themselves more aware of the need to assess how they're doing and manage their own learning. Have some sense of where they need to go to find the information that they need. And some skills of evaluation to make some sense of it. Uh, if I ask my students, where is it that you learn the most important things in your life and nobody ever says inside a classroom? You know? And that too ought to give us some pause. This, I, I really have to think because, you know, I think about all the stuff I put out to students when I started out. And I had a sense that they didn't remember all that much, but I, I kept telling myself, well, they remember the broad outlines, you know. Well, why don't we talk about the broad outlines then, you know, and make sure they've got that. You know, as a historian, I should be embarrassed, I suppose, to say that it wasn't until I got into graduate school that I even had an idea what history was. You know, I thought it was a long I remember from, and I, I went to a, a good university for undergrad. I went to the University of Dallas, an undergrad in education. You know? And they have core curriculum, 78 hours in the core, and it's all kind of tied together, you know. But I thought history was a lot of battles, dates, kings, facts, that sort of thing, you know. It didn't occur to me that it was, you know, not just what happened. And so I am just driven that our students get out of my history courses, probably not knowing there is any facts, but understanding how historians think, how they you know, research, how they reach their conclusions. You know, one of the people that has had most influence on my teaching is a guy named William Perry. I don't know if he's familiar with any of them. Back in 1970, he wrote uh, Frames of Intellectual and Ethical Development in College Students. He was a Harvard um, educational psychologist, and he looked at, at papers that students at Harvard had turned in and sort of assessed their change over time as they were going through Harvard. And he came up with a uh, schema that, you know, that said even at Harvard, and I guess I think said the early, earlier times, students came in a fairly dualistic mode, you know, kind of guessing over out one black white, you know, I come here to get the answers, you've got the answers, give them to me. 
uh, it, it doesn't take long for students to realize <coughs> that everything uh, has an answer, there's more complicated questions, you know, it's, it's not just ways to answer. Uh, and they slip into a, a mode he calls multiplicity, the lowest level of which is one opinion is as good as another. But it surely doesn't take long for them to figure out some opinions have data to back them up, you know, they have other forms of verisimilitude, you know, that make you think that makes more sense. If they continue to grow, they finally begin to realize that uh, what we're doing in college is teaching them what we think is correct, and we know we might be wrong. And that makes the truths we teach them wrong. And the science is they're used to this, you know. Um, I have had such pains to make sure my students never leave my class ever utter the phrase, scientists have proven that. <laughs> I said, don't prove anything. You know, they will draw a hypothesis that it seems to explain the observed phenomena, and if you get an outlier, it's back to the drawing board. I said, you know, that's the same in history. They go, huh? Well, yeah. I said, you know, folks, uh, I am 66 years old. I was taught white man's history. <laughs> I went to segregated schools until I was in college. And now, of course, as a historian, I know that was the consensus history period when there was the you know, focus on all in this together, you know, us against the comedy, that sort of thing, so we didn't talk about any problems or anything like that. You know. What we say about the past is history, it's not the past, it's what we say about it, and that's changed so radically over time. You know. That's one of the reasons I love the first chapters in our Hollis text, because it'll give you four presentations of the same thing, and they're just wildly different. You know. uh, and so, anyway, I, I'm also, I'm, Hopeful also that students leave us aware that not only is there so much they don't know, but what they think they know has a tentative quality to it. And yet they've got to go out and make commitments in that world, you know, with those tentative little truths. When we're teaching critical thinking, among the things we don't do a very good job of, but we need to do a better job, is to focus on the sort of temperaments that that generates in the student, intellectual We're going to produce truly well-rounded students. We need to do a better job of that. Anyway, uh, I think about this a lot, you know, and I tell this to students, you know, who expect that I'm going to give them a lot of information. I say, we'll remember it anymore, you know. Uh, so why don't we get at something that perhaps is a bit more important? The basics of cooperation in the class. Students not only must learn to work together, but must also be held responsible for the teammates learning to work together. Um, I honestly believe that these things are characteristic of a good cooperative learning atmosphere. Uh, I think their achievement is higher because, again, I think when they have the benefit of the thoughts of others, they can kind of hone their own thinking or get, get new insights from others and incorporate them as appropriate. Uh, I had 90% retention last semester, and that's not because I'm good. I just, I really think it's because you know, increasingly, I think they feel it's a pretty good atmosphere. You know, it, there's not a lot of threat there. I'll do what I can to help them get through. You know, I mean, I had, I think I had about 85 in all my class. I was astounded at that. Usually, I was about 75. So I don't know what the difference is. Sometimes you get skewed distributions. Yeah. Um, I think when you do it right, you can get them to higher level reasoning, deeper level understanding, and critical thinking. Um, and certainly the social competencies. I mean, one of the things that you know we increasingly are aware of is the need in the industry for students to come out not as those you know uh, uh, overcharged individual achievers, but people who can work in a group to achieve a common goal. You know? It's sort of fascinating to me that in the news, what about three weeks ago, to think about Yahoo, wasn't it? Calling their folks back. And what was often said was that, you know, when they were working individually, they probably were more productive, but they weren't nearly as innovative because they didn't have that sort of, you know, intellectual byplay that comes from constant association with others and testing out ideas, you know. Uh, when I was young, I always thought the ideal college classroom was sort of like, almost like a pinball machine where, you know, you, one idea would, you know, would 
go at it this way, and it would cause somebody else to think about something else, and it just it, it continued to just firm me. I didn't see that a lot, but I always hoped for it. I thought that'd be a great thing, but I think that's kind of one place behind uh, people working together and learning to work together well with people different from them. Um, and lastly, I do think that, that this is often an outcome of a greater psychological well-being and self-esteem. Having taught community colleges since 1975, um, you know, as I said when I started out, we get a lot of students that are pretty unsure of their ability to do this. Um, and as they experience success and find they do it, they can do it well, it's marvelous to watch them. Yeah. I think about one young woman I had about five years ago, and I, she was over in a group over here, and I'd look at her and she'd put her eyes down. You know? and She's graduated from A&M this year. She's going to be a teacher. She's one of the most outgoing people I've ever seen in my life. She's an absolute success. It's just been wonderful to watch that. When I was at the Richland, uh, UTV back then was a junior senior institution. And so we wound up working with them. We started an honors program in 1986 and found that among the best students we had were women returning to school, about 38, 40, 42, 45 years old. That's what we did. Most of them would come in not too sure that they really belonged there, you know, and our counselors would start talking to them, you know, and find out, you know, what their scores were. And maybe they weren't great, but they really were motivated and they had a lot of life experience. And they started following them a lot of times in the honors class. And they were the ones that started getting scholarships. self-esteem obviously from tremendous consequences of experiences they had. So, you know, uh, can you advise us your teaching? Do you see real problems in your life? Do you feel like a neophyte, like a vegetarian at a barbecue? <laughs> I can speak to that, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what changes might you want to be things that seems evident about y'all is that uh, well you're here on a Friday afternoon when it's beautiful <laughs> first of all that says something uh, it says to me that you take your teaching very seriously that you're constantly a better way is to connect with your students a better way is to help them to help themselves and I, I think that's obviously what we're about I just would say again that current trends are toward active I think every course can benefit from it. I know North Carolina's lady wants to support you in doing that. And as I said, in our job as well, often that is we make ourselves unnecessary. Still have questions? <laughs> <laughs> Hard to believe in it. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>